Shalom and welcome back to Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking about love, a test of love. I'm going to share a teaching with you that's used with permission from Bible.org, copyright of Stephen J. Cole from 1995. Oftentimes I find that the coverage of a particular topic done by others is uh, quite profound and quite revelatory. He begins, a little girl was invited for dinner at the home of her first grade friend. The vegetable was buttered broccoli and the mother asked if she like it. liked it. Oh yes, the child replied politely, I love it. But when the bowl of broccoli was passed, she declined to take any. The hostess said, I thought you said you love broccoli. The girl replied sweetly, oh yes ma'am, I do, but not enough to eat it. Do you love your family? Of course I do. We all would say that. It's the only right answer. But what do you mean by love? So often we love our family like that little girl loved broccoli. We love in the abstract, but when it comes right down to it, we don't want to get too close. In the words of the Apostle John, we love in word, but not in deed and truth from 1 John 3.18. What does biblical love look like? We know that our relationships in the family need to be marked by love. Husbands especially are to love their wives, but wives too must love their husbands. Parents and children, brothers and sisters must love one another. But how do we know what such love looks like in everyday dress? Paul's famous chapter on love, 1 Corinthians 13, tells us. The Corinthian church was emphasizing a good thing spiritual gifts to the neglect of the best. They were using their gifts apart from love. Paul makes the point that the use of their God-given gifts would amount to nothing if the Corinthians did not make love their priority. Selfless love is the priority for every believer. These verses are the most eloquent and profound words ever written on the subject of love. To comment on its parts is a bit like giving a botany lecture on a beautiful flower. If you're not careful, you, you, you lose the beauty and the impact of it. But we can profit from understanding the parts and applying it to family relationships. In verses 1 to 3, he shows the preeminence of love. That love is greater than all spiritual gifts because without love, gifts are empty. In verses 4 to 7, he shows the practice of love, how love is greater than all spiritual gifts because of its selfless characteristics. In verses 8 to 13, he shows the permanence of love, that love is greater than all spiritual gifts because it outlasts them. We're going to focus mainly on verses 4 to 7 where Paul describes how love acts. While in English most of these words are predicate adjectives, in Greek they're verbs. Love is not talk, it is action. We're all prone to apply verses like these to others. My mate and my kids could sure use a lesson in love, but me, I'm basically a loving person. I'm really easy to get along with. But I ask each of you to forget about everybody else and ask God to apply these verses to you. Paul enumerates 15 characteristics of love to show how love acts or what it looks like in everyday life. A New Testament definition of agape is a caring self-sacrifice commitment which shows itself in seeking the highest good of the one loved. Messiah in his sacrificial death on the cross is the epitome and embodiment of this kind of love. A whole series of sermons could easily be preached on these qualities of love but let's look briefly at each of them. Selfless love is patient. Ouch. Why did he put that first? This often confronts me with my failure in relating to my family. Patience is an interesting quality in that when I don't need it, I want it. It's when things start to infuriate me or irritate me or frustrate me that I need patience, but usually at that point, I don't want to be patient. The Greek word comes from two words meaning long-tempered. If you're patient, you're slow to anger. 
You endure personal wrongs without retaliating. You bear with others imperfections, faults, and differences. You give them time to change, room to make mistakes without coming down hard on them. Do you do that, men, with your wife and children? I read a story of a man who had developed this quality to a far greater extent than I. During the late 1500s, Dr. Thomas Cooper edited a dictionary with the addition of 33,000 words <clears throat> and many other improvements. He had already been collecting materials for eight years when his wife, a rather difficult woman, went into his study one day while he was gone and burned all of his notes under the pretense of fearing that he would kill himself with study. Eight years of work, a pile of ashes. Dr. Cooper came home, saw the destruction, and asked who had done it. His wife told him boldly that she had done it. The patient man heaved a deep sigh and said, O oh, Dinah, Dinah, thou, thou hast given me a world of trouble. Then he quietly sat down to another eight years of hard labor to replace the notes which she had destroyed. Next time you think you've arrived at being patient, that will give you something to aim for. Selfless love is kind. Kindness is patience in action. The Greek word comes from a word meaning useful. A kind person is disposed to be helpful. He seeks out needs and looks for opportunities to meet those needs without repayment. He is tender and forgiving when wronged. The word was used of mellow wine and suggests a person who is gentle or has an ability to soothe hurt feelings, to calm an upset person, to help quietly in practical ways. The kind person shows kindness in response to harsh treatment. Yeshua said, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same thing. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. From Luke, Luke 6, 33 and 35. The kindness of God leads us to repentance, Romans 2 and 4. Kindness motivates others towards positive change. As with patience, the real promise you know, I just have to excuse me for one minute while I correct my personal error here. As with patience, the real proven ground for kindness is the home. Are you kind to your wife and children? Do you do kind, useful things for them? Are you training your children to be kind to one another by the way you treat your wife and them? Love is not macho, love is kind. Selfless love is not jealous. The word means to eagerly desire, and it's used both positively and negatively in the Bible. Jealousy in the negative sense is related to greed and selfishness. The jealous person wants what others have, he wants things for himself. He's too selfish to applaud others' success. He has to have all the attention. In the family, a jealous husband refuses to trust his wife. He doesn't want to recognize her abilities and contributions. He's jealous of the time she spends with the children or with her friends. He wants it all for himself. James says that jealousy is often the source of quarrels and conflicts. From James 4 and 2. Selfless love does not brag and is not arrogant. These ugly twins are related. They both stem from selfishness and are the flip side of jealousy. Jealousy is wanting what someone else has. Bragging is trying to make others jealous of what we have. Jealousy puts others down. Bragging builds us up. Bragging is an outward manifestation of pride. The braggart tries to impress others of his great accomplishments in order to make himself look good. After all I've done for you and you treat me this way? But love isn't trying to build up me. Love is trying to build up the other person. Love is humble. 
The humble, loving person is aware that everything he has is an undeserved gift from God. 1 Corinthians 4 and 7. So he doesn't boast, but thankfully uses what God has given to serve others. Selfless love does not act unbecomingly. The NIV translates, <clears throat> it is not rude. Love does not needlessly offend. Love has good manners. It's courteous, polite, sensitive to the feelings of others, and always uses tact. The reason we are not courteous, of course, is that we are thinking only of ourselves and not of others. I read of a man who was generally lacking in manners. He never opened the car door for his wife. She doesn't have two broken arms, he would say. After many years of marriage, <coughs> his wife died. At the funeral, as the pallbearers brought her casket out to the hearse, the husband was standing by the car door. The funeral director, who knew the husband by name, called out to him and said, open the door for her, will you? He reached for the car door and then for one second froze. He realized that he had never opened the door for her in life. Now, in her death, it would be the first, last, and only time. A lifetime of regret came crashing down around him. Love is not rude. Selfless love does not seek its own. It is not selfish, does not demand its rights. Alan Redpath said, the secret of every discord in Christian homes, communities, and churches is that we seek our own way and our own glory. R.C.H. Lenski put it, cure selfishness and you plant a garden of Eden. Selfishness is the root problem of the human race. It is the antithesis of love, which is self-sacrificing. Elizabeth Elliot was once speaking on this subject to an audience that included some young children who were sitting right in front of her. As she spoke, she wondered how she could make this plain to them so that they could apply it. Later, she got a letter from one of those children, a six-year-old boy who wrote, I am learning to lay down my life for my little sister. She has to take a nap in the afternoon. I don't have to take a nap, but she can't go to sleep unless I come and lay down beside her. So I lay down with my little sister. That boy is learning to love. If husbands and wives, as well as children, would apply this verse as that little boy did, our homes would be free of conflict and honor to Messiah, who did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many, from Mark 10:45. Aren't you glad Messiah didn't insist on his rights? He would have stayed in heaven, and we would not have salvation. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us selfless love is not provoked. The word means to sharpen, stimulate, rouse to anger. Phillips paraphrases, it's not touchy. Love does not have a hair trigger temper. Some people make everyone around them walk on eggshells. They're easily offended. <clears throat> One thing that doesn't go their way and kaboom, they use their temper to intimidate and to punish. When you confront them, they say, sure, I have a bad temper, but I get it all out and it's over in a few minutes. So is a bomb. But look at the devastation it leaves behind. When you're angry, usually you're not loving. Selfless love does not take into account a wrong suffered. This is an accounting word used of numerical calculations. It's used of God not imputing our guilt to us, but instead imputing the righteousness of Messiah to our account. That's from Romans 4, 6, and 8. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs and bear a grudge until everyone is paid for. It doesn't try to gain the upper hand by reminding the other person of past wrongs. Love forgives. One married man said to his friend, you know, every time my wife and I got into a conflict, she gets historical. His friend said, historical? Don't you mean hysterical? No, I mean historical. She rehearses everything I've ever done wrong in the whole history of our marriage. That's keeping score. That's not love. Selfless love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in truth. These qualities are the flip side of one another. Moffat puts it, love is never glad when others go wrong. To rejoice in the truth means to be glad about behavior 
in accordance with the truth of God's word. If someone you don't like falls into sin, you don't gloat, you grieve, because God is grieved over sin. If they repent, you rejoice. There is a fine balance to love. Although love is kind and overlooks the faults of others, it does not compromise the truth or take a soft view of sin. To allow another person to go on in sin, whether it is known sin or a blind spot, is not to seek his best. It is not love. Love will sensitive, sensi sensitively confront and correct precisely because it cares deeply and knows that sin destroys. Love rejoices with the truth. Love gets excited when it hears of spiritual victories. Love encourages by expressing joy over little evidences of growth. Of growth. John, the apostle of love, wrote, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in truth from 3 John 4. Selfless love bears all things. The word can mean either to bear up under or protect by covering. If it has the first meaning, then it would be the same as endures all things. I prefer the second meaning, to protect by covering. Love doesn't broadcast the problems of others. Love doesn't run down others with jokes, sarcasm, or put-downs. Love defends the character of the other person as much as possible within the limits of truth. Love won't lie about weaknesses, but neither will it deliberately expose and emphasize them. Love protects. Selfless love believes all things. The NIV translate, love always trusts. This does not mean gullibility. It does mean that love is not suspicious and doubting of the other person's character and motives without good reason, even if his actions offended you. If trust has been broken, then it needs to be earned again step by step. But love believes the other person is innocent until proven guilty, not guilty until proven innocent. If there is a problem, love doesn't jump immediately to blame the other person. In the family, trust shows itself by not grilling the other person about every detail of his story, like an attorney cross-examining a defendant. It means believing in your kids, expressing confidence in them. I'm thankful that my parents trusted me as a teenager. It made me want to live up to that trust. One of my friends had parents who did not trust him, and he lived up to their distrust. Sometimes you will get ripped off when you trust, but love persists in trusting. Selfless love hopes all things, from 1 Corinthians 13, 14. It is not pessimistic. It does not expect the one loved to fail, but to succeed. Love refuses to take failure as final. It exudes a godly optimism which says, I know you can do it because God in you is able. It does not ignore reality. It doesn't close its eyes to problems but it rests on the promises of God that he is working all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so love always hopes. Selfless love endures all things. The word endures is a military word meaning to sustain the assault of an enemy. It has the idea of holding up under trial, of perseverance in spite of difficulties. It means that love hangs in there. It's not just a passive, stoic attitude. It's a positive, triumphant spirit that sticks it out. There is an epidemic among believers of bailing out of tough situations. People don't like something that happens in a church. They go find another church more to their liking. They run into their problems or disagreements in their marriage, grow tired of the effort and bail out. But you say is an adultery a legitimate grounds for divorce? Technically, yes, but all too often one partner uses it as an excuse to bail out of a marriage where both partners have wronged one another repeatedly in many ways. I'm not minimizing the seriousness of adultery. It destroys trust and creates all sorts of problems in marriage. I'm not suggesting that it's easy to work through. It takes a lot of hard work to rebuild one brick at a time. But God's best is to forgive and renew the marriage, not to bail out, as love endures all things. That's how love acts. It is selfless, wholly directed to build the other person. Of course, nobody can love like that. Only God is love, 1 John 4 and 7. 
put Messiah in verses 4 and 7 instead of love and you have a description of him. He is patient, kind, not jealous, does not brag, is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, does not seek his own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. He always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. If we want to love one another, we must focus on his love for us and walk in his spirit who produces his love in us, from Galatians 5 and 22. Humorist Sam Levinson says, love at first sight is easy to understand. It's when two people have been looking at each other for years that it becomes a miracle. But it's not really a miracle. It's the result of yielding to God, repeatedly confronting our selfishness and daily, practice, daily practicing biblical love in our homes. An old legend says that in his old age, the apostle John was so weak that he had to be carried into church meetings. At the end of the meeting, he would be helped to his feet to give a word of exhortation. He would invariably repeat, little children love one another. The disciples grew weary of the same word in words every time. Finally, they asked him why he said the same thing over and over. He replied, because it is the commandment of the Lord, and the observation of it alone is sufficient. Someone has said that if we discovered that we had only five minutes left to say all we wanted to say, every telephone booth would be occupied by people calling other people to stammer that they love them. Selfless love is our, pr our priority. Pursue love, verse 14 and 1. When I became a believer and I read the New Testament for the first time, I had a Bible that was new to me. It was green, it was an NIV, and my name was engraved on the front of it. And I sat down after accepting the Messiah in December of 1996 and lay in my bed and read the New Testament for the first time. As I read it, I understood it in context, in the context of the Jewish life and times of Jesus. As I began to read the writings of Paul, and I came to 1 Corinthians 13, I was already 44 years of age, and I had lived a life that was rocky at best in relationships, cavalier attitude toward attitude towards the world, had made fortunes and lost fortunes, had had great successes and had great failures, had lived a very rich and full life, gone where I wanted to go, do what I wanted to do. But the one thing that escaped me was real love. And so as I began to read <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it was as if it was an aha moment for me. But my attitude about it was naive and self-centered. And in the margin of 1 Corinthians 13, I wrote, if love does not look like this, it is not love. Those words still are emblazed in the page of the Bible that's now worn, torn, and faded and marked up and the bindings falling off of it. But when I wrote those words in the margin of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it was how I was going to assess and evaluate whether someone else loved me. I was going to use it as my test. If they were not patient with me, they didn't love me. If they were easily angered, they didn't love me. If they kept records of wrongs, they didn't love me. As I began to be discipled and trained in the faith and in the scriptures, several years later, I returned to those notes and modified them and changed the words to say that if I don't love like this, then I don't love. We examine the scriptures from a very self-centered perspective. 
we look to apply tests and scriptures to other people. How often have I heard somebody say to me after a sermon, oh, I wish so-and-so were here, that sermon was just for them. And I think to myself, no, that sermon was just for you. And while you were sitting there thinking about somebody else, you were not taking the message into your heart and letting God speak to you. The scriptures were written to us. Every author writes to the reader. I, as an author of published books, write to my readers. When I write a sermon or a message or a rant, it is written for you, the audience. But it's drawn from my own experience. The message that I received first that I would take ownership of in my own life and in my own heart and then share with you. 1 Corinthians 13 was a convicting, very much convicting. For it said that if I have not love, I am nothing but a clanging symbol. My words are empty. If I prophesy, it's meaningless. If I teach, it's void. If I do not have love, I have nothing. And so I looked over the past years and I looked and examined and applied that test and began to realize that it was me. It wasn't that people loved or did not love me. Had I loved this way? Was my fulfilling the prophetic life, death, and resurrection of the Messiah, was I fulfilling it in the way I loved, in the way I loved my daughter? in the way I love my friends, or in the way I would love someone special to me. And I found that we are incredibly selfish, and that we use the scriptures to measure others. And it was never given to us to measure others. It was given to us as a measurement for us to measure ourselves against, to set a standard for us to be able to obtain more of the likeness of Messiah. When we look at those words, love is patient, love is kind, love is not easily angered, love is long-suffering, love keeps no lo record of wrongs. And then finally it says, love never fails. People fail, love does not. And when we examine our hearts to see, are we capable of completely selfless love? Are we capable of serving others without any regard for ourselves? Yes, we have those moments. And I still have those moments when I take inventory of how much I've done for someone. And why aren't they responding the way I want them to respond? But I have to take the time to reconcile myself to that is not the calling that is on my life or on your life. We are called to selflessly love, to give of ourselves. The psychologist would tell you that you must be fulfilled, you must be acknowledged, you must be validated, you must be all these things, but the Bible tells you that you are to serve and that if you are acknowledged, if you receive all these accolades, then you've received your just reward on earth. But God encourages us to store up treasures in heaven, not on earth. Where on earth they will rust and fade away. But in heaven they are eternal. Is that naive? Is that utopian? Is that Pollyanna? Is that a belief that we are capable of selflessly loving and never considering ourselves? And my answer to you is no, we are not capable of that. But we are capable of reconciling ourselves that when we have those feelings, that we do not act upon them. When we have that knee-jerk response that we remember that we are to put a guard on our mouth and to let nothing come from our mouths which is not for the encouragement and the betterment of another. God will sometimes put a break of silence 
in between two people, a time of separation where emotions can settle and we can take the attitude of appreciation and gratitude. Often in marriage counseling, I would ask a couple, will this matter, this issue that is tearing the two of you apart, will this matter in six months? Will it matter in a year? Will it even matter next week? And if it will not, then put it on the shelf. <clears throat> Find a way to work through it. Because if it's not gonna matter in the long term, then you must not give it life in the short term. Communication, essential. But husbands are called to love their wives. What does that look like? Gary Chapman has written a great series on the love languages, but what if you don't understand that, if you don't comprehend that? If for you as a man, you believe that being the provider is what you're supposed to do and that is your expression of love, but your wife receives love through quality time or through words of encouragement. She can't understand your covering of provision as your expression of love. She still needs that time with you. And if you truly care about her, you will find a way to become multilingual. If you were to relocate to another country as part of your job and were required to be there long enough to learn the language, you would find a way to learn the language. Why? Because it was important to your survival. So it is in relationships. We are to learn the language of our partner. And in this way, we remove our agenda and we begin to listen for what they think and what they need. Imagine a world in which husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends, whatever relationship that you are in, that you serve the needs of each other. You looked out for each other's back. You took care of of uh, what each one of you required, then both of your needs would be fulfilled. You would be in a selfless relationship, and so would your spouse. But yet both of your needs are being served. When we have Rhonda Stapion, who does the No Regrets Hour, She's talked about the no regret life, meaning you do what you need to do without regret. You find a way to talk about what needs to be talked about, to resolve what needs to be resolved, but always in the deepest sense of love and appreciation. She's written a book entitled, If My Husband Would Just Change, I Would Be Happy, and other myths that women believe. Because our prayer must not be to God, Lord, please change my spouse or change this person in my life. Our prayer must be, Lord, let there be change, but let that change begin with me. Let God circumcise our hearts to be conformed to the heart of Messiah, that we would understand that love is patient and love is kind. Love is not easily angered. Love keeps no records of wrong. Love is not rude, Lo love is not boastful, it is not prideful. It does not delight in the problems of others or the failures of others, but it never fails. How many of us can say that we have had in our lifetime a love that never failed? In truth, the love didn't fail, we did. We allowed our feelings, our soulless selves, to get in the way of what God had for us. I came to faith and began to believe that God would orchestrate and bring into my life that which he would want for me. I still trust in that to this very day. And the things that he's revealed to me 
make me comfortable in this state that I am currently in. If you are single and God has promised you that he will bring you someone, then he will be faithful to do so and does not need your help by going out on dating sites or hanging out in bars. If you are single and God has told you that you will remain single, then you have your answer. And God will prepare you and sustain you through that. He'll surround you with love of family and love of friends because God is love. He will bring love into your life if you will perceive it and if you will receive it. God does not fail. God is not slow as we define slowness to keep his promises. He is able and capable and does sustain us through the seasons of our life where we are searching, wanting, and open to find a love greater than the love we've ever known. But the love he gave us was Messiah. And if each of us would focus our love on Messiah and look for that to be our fulfillment, we will take the burden off the people of our, in our lives who we now assign that fulfillment to. We will relieve them of a tremendous burden because the burden has already been taken by Yeshua. He has taken that burden for us. And when we no longer hold our spouse or our loved one responsible for our feelings, but we lay them on the altar and hand them over to God, then what happens is our hands are open and free to receive, to find appreciation in the tender moments, to find appreciation in the quiet times, to find appreciation in the stillness and the quietness of the small moments and not the big things. God's love for us is patient. God's love for us is kind. God's love for us is not proud or boastful. And he sets the example of love for each one of us. But if we do not have Messiah squarely in the middle of that, then we will not succeed in love. And who of us does not want to succeed in love? If you don't know the Messiah, the first step is to accepting the love of God through the shed blood of our Messiah. To say yes to his plan of salvation, his plan of redemption, and his plan of love. Say yes to him and begin your journey to receiving the kind of love that's exceedingly and abundantly above everything you could ever imagine. We'll be right back.